Welcome back to the Shifting Schools podcast. My name is Trisha Friedman, and today I am actually speaking with a return guest, Swapna Krishna. If you're a longtime listener, you might remember her from episode 213, being a science communicator, where she came on the show to talk about her journey into that role. And students who are interested in merging writing and science, what they might want to do. Today, however, she is here as part of our mini series on social emotional learning to talk about her brand new book. This is a book that I fell in love with. Um, this is a, it is literally a gift book, but it's also a great book for you to gift to yourself to family and friends. We'll talk about what you might do collaboratively with this book a little bit later on. Stargazing, Contemplate the Cosmos to Find Inner Peace merges together the science I learned a lot about space from this book with meditations that we can do to just build in a little bit of well-being for ourselves. The question for me that I left this conversation with is how are we positioning science not only as a source of inspiration for students, but also as a potential pathway for wellness. Swapna is also going to talk to us about the craft behind this text and her, her process. So if you are also a teacher of writing, she digs into the skill sets that are essential in putting together a text like this. Let me tell you a little bit more about Swapna Krishna. She's a journalist specializing in space, science, technology, and science fiction. She is the host of Far Out on PBS, a regular contributor to New Scientist, Wired, NPR, Star Trek.com, and Star Wars.com, and is also the co and is also the co-editor of Sword Stone Table, an anthology of inclusive retellings of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table lore. Krishna lives in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In the show notes, you're going to find lots of information about her work. We would also really highly recommend you check out that PBS series far out. Both Jeff and I fell head over heels in love for it. So if you have a student or someone in your life who is interested in space, Swapna Krishna's work is definitely some work to share. With that, on with the show. Thank you so much for returning to the podcast. It's always a joy to get to speak with you. Um, and it's a super joy to be speaking with you today during what is um, the official book birthday week for your brand new book that's entitled Stargazing, Contemplate the Cosmos to Find Inner Peace, where you connect the reader with science, with wellness, with meditation, with the long history of star watching, as well as its place in mythology. And what's really amazing is you do all of that in a book that is gift pocket size. It's under 150 pages. So I'm wondering, you pack so much into this book. How did you decide like what you wanted to prioritize and spotlight inside of this gift book that is a gift in more ways than one? It was it was a lot because as you said it's it's only about 12,000 words it's you know in a normal you know nonfiction book is like 75,000 100,000 words so it's small um but I was lucky in that this is part of a series it's part of the Pocket Nature series at Chronicle Books so there were previous books in the series that are the same format about the same length about other aspects of nature there's one on a really cool one on clouds one on mushrooms um, and so my editor was able to send me those and I was able to look at how other people had structured theirs and kind of get some ideas. But I also knew from the beginning, 
it was pitched to me as a mindfulness book about the stars. And my intention was to turn that around and make it a book about the science and stars and the history and have some mindfulness in it because they came to me, a science writer, like my thing is science and space. They didn't go to a, a somebody with therapy background or a mindfulness background. So I approached it as a science person and how um, I see the universe and my personal cl- connection with it. Because I think something that we miss a lot is that our connection with the night sky is very personal. It is very emotional. I've had a lot of people tell me, um, after reading this book, they got teary, this, they cried, like there's just, you know, it's, it's a kind and gentle book. And that, that was my intention. I wanted it to be this thing that made you feel good about yourself, this thing that uh, made you feel good about the night sky and encourages people to walk outside and look up and have this relationship with the stars. Yeah, for me as a reader, there were sort of two things um, that connect with what you just said. One, I felt much more informed, actually, like as a uh, star gazing, uh, like grower, somebody that feels inspired to do it. Like you, there, there was a lot that I learned, and we'll dig into the science in a little bit. But also, you were very transparent with how meditation hasn't necessarily come easily for you. And that really resonated with me because it hasn't for myself either. I've tried a lot of different things. I have a lot of friends who feel the same way. It's tough. And I feel like the messaging in this book too is find a form of meditation that works for you. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering actually if you would talk a little bit more about how you found stargazing as as kind of a, an access point for you into wellness, because as you said, you're a science journalist, you've got the great PBS series Far Out, but you also are really interested in sort of like science fiction, like Star Wars. So I'm wondering where that initial spark came from and if it connects both to your interest um, in sci-fi and then actually just pure science as well. So it's funny that you bring up sci-fi because the idea of using the stars for mindfulness actually came to me from Star Trek. There's an episode of Star Trek Voyager um, in the, I think, the fourth season. And I'm like blanking on the name. I'm sure listeners will know it if you're a Star Trek fan. But it's an episode basically where the ship goes into this void. And they're in this void for like traveling across this void in space for like two years. And it's this pocket of space where there are no stars. And it's about the psychological impacts this has on the crew. It's about, um, there's a lot of stuff about um, like, you know, what, not having the comfort of being able to like looking outside and just seeing black all the time. There's no stars. There's no nebula. There's no, there's nothing. It's just black. So that part of it. And then there's a, there's a scene in this, um, in the show where Tuvok, who's the Vulcan, who's very like into meditation, he actually walks into astrometrics, which is like their like science kind of a science area of the ship and puts on like an image of the stars and meditates because he was like I he tells one of the characters that like I use the stars to meditate each star is a thought and I come in here to do it because I can't look outside I can't do it for my quarters and that's kind of where the spark came from um in terms of thinking of a personal relationship with the night sky using for meditation I was very young but like as um an as uh, a kid who grew up Indian American, I've always been exposed to meditation because it's a big part of my culture. So I've always known that this is a thing that people do. And so I started that very young. I also knew from a young age, I was a very anxious person. Um, And uh, I have a very like buzzing mind and I need, like I personally do better when I work on quieting that down. And so that's where it started. So that, that kind of like, that's where the spark came from. And then from there, um, and it's not something like I actively thought about. I actually recently made the connection that that's where it's from. Um, it's not something I actively ta- thought about in my life, but it's just that idea that, that you know, that we are all stardust. We are all a part of this. And, um, that, re- and that, that really comes from sci-fi for me and from Star Trek specifically. Um, like that is like the one thing I can point to when people ask, like, why do you have the career you do? Why are you interested in the things you're interested in? And like Star Trek, that's huge. That was been informative for me my entire life. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where the idea of using the stars for meditation came from. I there's so much about what you just said that I I really appreciate and that I think will resonate with our educator audience because 
for our students who are really passionate about a show or a series, like digging in and seeing where that interest might take them, I think is part of the work of teaching. And I love that your journey started from sci-fi. And, you know, again, you've written for so many different outlets. So um, that's um, that that's beautiful to hear. Now, the book also digs into the real science. I said, like, there was a lot of learning that I took away from it. I had never heard of the concept of a dark sky preserve before. Um, and you also introduced me to the website darksky.org where folks can find a dark sky preserve. Uh, I was very fortunate to, a few years ago, my wife and I lived on Gabriola Island, which is one of the Gulf Islands off Vancouver Island. Very, very remote. I have never experienced the night sky like I did when we were living there. It was just almost overwhelming sometimes. Um, I'm wondering if you might share with our listeners an anecdote about what has been one of your favorite places that you have stargazed from. I have a couple. Um, I have a few favorite places. Um, First, I went, took a trip with my mom and my sister last year after I turned in the book. It was kind of sort of like a celebratory. I'm done with the book, sort of a, you know, a girl's trip with my mom and my sister. Um, And we went to Sedona. And while we were there, we went with a guide on a nighttime stargazing hike. And, you know, Sedona is very beautiful and has, if you go to the right areas, very dark sky. Um, And we just sat there for like three hours on this huge rock and just looked at the stars and like, you know, it was, it was incredible. And it was incredible because my family likes space. They all think it's cool. My sister's a big Star Trek fan. I watched Star Trek growing up with my parents, but the impetus, my sister introduced me to Star Trek, but I was the one who ran with that. (laughs) Um, so like my parents watch Star Trek with me and they enjoy it, but it's not like their thing. And like, I'm actively, there is a 99% chance on any moment of any given day, I'm actively having some sort of thought about space or the stars or, you know, I'm, that's, it's just, it's my thing. Like, I I love it. I, I, it's like, it nurtures me and it, it like nurtures my soul. They don't have that same relationship with it. And that's okay. You don't have to. But part of that experience for me was taking them out so they could see what I see and experience what I experienced. And I really feel like they did. And um, they had a wonderful, wonderful experience. And the other um, the other one I want to share, um, I have, you know, there's a bunch. Anywhere I go where there's a dark sky, I try to get on Stargaze. My husband is very, very supportive of, like, Anytime we're anywhere in the wilderness, like trying to find some a dark sky site, trying to find somewhere to take me because he knows I love it, especially now that we have a young, I have a son and, you know, I want to pass that love on to him. But the other one I will say is I wrote the bulk of this book on a writing retreat in the Poconos uh, Mountains outside of Philadelphia, like three hours away from Philadelphia where I live. It's a um, highlights like the kids magazine, which educator audience will be very familiar with. Um, they do a, they have like their retreat center in the Poconos Mountains, um, you know, like out like in the mountains, it's beautiful. And you can go and it's relatively inexpensive to go. You can set up a personal retreat. It's like hundred dollars a night, maybe. And all, you know, farm to table food is included and, um, you know, all your meals and you basically get a cabin and you can just write. And so that's what I did for this book because I was like, I, I have to get away and write this book because it's so hard to concentrate on something like this, like when you're trying to go through your day to day life. So I went away and I wrote it, but like, it was so magical is like the only way I can think of to describe it, to be in my cabin, writing this book, be outside writing this book. And then to like go outside after my writing session and look up at the stars and Hey, there's the stars I've been writing about. It was, it was a really interesting experience. That makes sense because, again, like the book is kind of a magical experience, too. When I was describing, um, you know, you, you have actual short, very accessible meditations that folks can do when they're stargazing. So I was reading part of one to my wife and she's like, let's make this part of our wellness routine. I was like, absolutely. Yes. Like, I love this is going to be a goal for the coming academic year. Um I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about your process, because I know some of our listeners will be thinking this could be a potentially really cool collaborative project where students think about some of their 
inspiration. They think about putting together a gift book for others. They think about maybe how can I design something that's also going to help others find well-being in a passion of mine. So I'm wondering, did the book come together like in a linear, linear format? Were the meditations first? How did you actually go about drafting this text? The meditations were first. Because that's what I wanted the book to be built around. Like I, I built the structure of the book around the kinds of meditations. Um, and so the meditations were first, they got tweaked a lot. Like I, I, I updated them as I was going, but I kind of wrote those first and then um, the introduction and um, I, I basically wrote everything but the like history and culture chapter. And that came last because that was a lot of research so I wrote everything else because a lot of that was a- I was able to do from memory or just with like cursory. I fa- I fact check everything and I had a great fact checker on top of my own fact checking. But um, that stuff, I, I know um, the constellations. So I'm actually it's funny because I'm actually not the best at picking out the patterns in the sky. And so part of the reason I have such guided, detailed guides to ha- how you find these constellations it's, it's not easy for me either like it's like I don't there are very few constellations I just look at the sky like Cassiopeia Orion you know or some major like those constellations are very very noticeable but like Bootes, I don't know that one off the top of my head but so like part of and even if I look at the sky I'm like I think that's it but I don't know so part of it is like these aren't they're not necessarily supposed to be like easy to find so like that was like that was a big step and then the um history and culture chapter was the one like I put the most like research into and like looked up scholar looked up journal articles looked up which people will find like in the back of the book like the further reading um as far as I get asked a lot like how do you know like when you're embarking on a big project like this like writing a book or doing like a really long article or something, how do you know what you want to write about how do you dig deep how do how can somebody else replicate this kind of thing like basically how do you know you're ready to write a book or how do you know you're ready to start this kind of project and my advice is for at least for writing a book you has to be a topic you're not going to get sick of because in any long project for me I reach a moment um, in like edits or in research or in writing where I'm like cancel the contract (laughs) I'm just I'm gonna send back the money I don't want to do this anymore. I never want to look at this again. No matter how much I love the subject, I always get to that point just because like you're editing and editing and you're like, oh my God, are we done yet? Like, oh my gosh, like I have a million other things to do. These edits just came back and I have to do this. And like, oh my God, just cancel it. I'm done. Never done that. But I always want to. So like part of it is pick a topic you love. Like have your students pick a topic that they can't get enough of. A, that they can't get enough of and they want other people to know about. B, because that's like the really two big things for me about this book. I can't get enough of the stars. I can't get enough of the night sky, no matter how much we're looking at them. Is it an amazing photo from an observatory? Is it just like going outside and looking up? Is it looking through a telescope from the ground? I can't get enough of them. And I want to tell other people why. I want to explain to other people why I love them and why maybe you can too. And so I think those are the two things. That's where you start. Loving it and wanting to share it with other people. Powerful message because, again, it's a great reminder to us to uh, leave that space for students to really find their interest. And the motivation factor, as you're saying, like the engagement factor will almost organically be there. It doesn't have to be manufactured. You also brought up your fact checker. And of course, you write for so many different mediums. Um, you know, you write for yourself as a YouTuber. Uh, listeners, I'll link to the episode where you talk about actually how the, the learning that you had to go through in terms of writing for yourself for YouTube was very different. Um, I'm wondering actually across all the different ways in which you are a writer, to what extent it's also useful for you to really flex your collaborative skills. Whenever we have a writer on the show, they often talk about there's almost a myth that writing is done like only by yourself. Um, but actually there's, you know, the editor, there's, as you mentioned, the fact checker, there might be an illustrator that you're partnering with. Um, to what extent do you feel like your collaborative skill set has sort of blossomed as you have been working on so many different types of projects for so many different types of audiences? Oh my God. 
hundred percent. Part of the hardest part about doing social media like TikTok and launching a YouTube channel, um, which I've been in, kind of in the process of doing, we haven't really had a hard launch, but um, is that it's so solitary. And I, 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 I like working by myself, but like, I'm so used to working with an editor. I'm so used to like, right now I'm working on my next book proposal, trying to figure out like, what do I want to write next? So I've been like emailing with my agent, like four times a day, just like random thoughts. And that's so helpful to get that feedback. That's so helpful to just like, you know, within for stargazing, I worked with an editor, my agent, my editor, um, a, a, a fact checker, a copy editor, a proofreader. Um, I didn't work directly with the artist, but I got all the illustrations, which are beautiful. The artist, both interior and cover, did a great job. But like, I I, pro I proofed them all and I looked at them. And it is, it's writing a book is such a collaborative experience. And I miss that for, um, for uh, like, for like social media, for content creation. I'm getting, still getting used to that. And I'm still getting used to YouTube. YouTube is such a... So different than anything else I've worked with. TikTok comes very naturally to me. That shorter style, the longer YouTube style, I'm still working on. And it's still like, so that's the thing. It's a work in progress. And the problem with a work in progress when you're doing it by yourself is you don't have much to go off of. You have your stats. You have like, how are people responding to this? But like, it's hard. And I, I love having people to bounce ideas off of, to ask questions of and that's why I value so much and I'm on social media so much because at least I have feedback and I have that collaboration with viewers and with other people like you know if a scientist is like retweeting my video and being like this is the best explanation of this I've seen so clear and I'm like oh feedback good thank you like because you know it's hard it is really hard to do it solitary and I I enjoy working with editors I think editors are necessary I think the reason I have am a, I consider myself a good writer at this point I think the reason I'm a good writer is because I've worked with good editors. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, that's, it's so collaborative and that's so important. I'm wondering if, if I can just ask a follow-up question about the social media piece. It's been on my mind because I was just listening to a podcast episode from Bridget Todd, one of my favorite podcasters. Her show is called There Are No Girls on the Internet. And she was talking about how TikTok is essentially creating like almost this renaissance of localized citizen journalism where, you know, at least when I was a kid growing up, local papers were kind of well-funded. A lot of folks were investing in them. They've gone away. But TikTok as a platform has sort of created um, a whole new market for localized journalists and citizen journalists to hone their craft. And I'm wondering as a, as a science journalist, what you feel the role of social media is going to be, or if you could even comment on the current state of, um, because I know sometimes when I talk about journalism and TikTok in the same sentence, sometimes folks really are sort of like, I thought it's just dances and dog videos, huh? So I think, um, short answer to your question is yes. I think TikTok is right now the single best way to access Gen Z. Like, I, I think, I don't think there's a better way to do it. I am not an online video person in terms of consuming it. I, I, I watch to research. I watch, you know, like, because I'm doing it. So I need to be up on what other people are doing, but it's not like my primary form of communication. I'm a writer. I like typing. That's, you know, why Twitter has always, was always my go-to, but I want to, if I want to talk to the, to people about these things and I want to reach new audiences, TikTok is like, is the best way to do that. I think there are definitely some, and I'm sure, you know, these have been talked about over and over again. There's definitely some, um, issues with TikTok, you know, the, um, the, uh, there's not a lot of fact checking. So like, People, you know, the the whole rise of like psychotherapy on TikTok and where people are like, these are symptoms of ADHD. And like, no, they're not necessarily. You've seen a lot of people commenting on that sort of thing. But also there's it raises awareness of things that people wouldn't otherwise have. And I think that's an amazing thing. I am constantly shocked and delighted by how many people on TikTok love space and how like I am not a person who 
I don't mind doing dances or like lip sync. I don't mind doing that. That's fine. But that's not the way I communicate with people. And I'm so gratified that I don't have to change what I'm doing or the way I talk to people in order to be successful there. Like I don't have, some people do. And that's because it's what's going to appeal to people. And that's great. But I think the like thing that the reason it resonates with me is I don't have to. It, just, it kind of comes naturally. I talk very fast. I'm loud. I'm enthusiastic. And I can just do those things and people respond to it. And I think that's amazing. And um, I think in a way, like, as we're trying to figure out what's going on in a post Twitter world, because it was it was vital for so many of us for so long. Um I think I don't think TikTok can replace it, but I think it's a really good way to reach people and talk about science and other serious topics. Yeah, I mean, I it's been fascinating to me the more I've investigated that space how there's sort of like a niche community for almost anything that you can think of. Yes. Like I stumbled upon power washing TikTok. Um, you know, in terms of getting recipes, for me now that's my go-to because I find, you yeah. know, if I Google for a recipe, I have to read sort of like 10 paragraphs before I even get to the list of ingredients. Um, so I think again, that's a it's a, an interesting thing to explore with our students who, as you mentioned, because there is so much mis and disinformation on social media, full stop. I think it's great to be talking to students about what are you engaging with there? Yes. Um, and what are you noticing for folks who are unfamiliar with TikTok? Of course, there are stitches. So you could have put up a video and then I can actually stitch myself kind of responding to you. So I've almost noticed a little bit of a fact checking or an opinion checking that way, which doesn't exist with any of the other platforms. So yeah. it's going to be interesting, I think, to even look at what is TikTok doing different apart from other platforms where the mis and disinformation is maybe um, the community is looking after it a little bit, which isn't, yeah. as you said, a perfect solution. Um, but but that's that's really interesting. Swap, now we, we wanted to speak with you again, not just because we love all of the work that you do and listeners, we're going to link to plenty of it over there in the show notes. But this book specifically, we felt really expands on this mini series that we're doing about social emotional learning and helping adults who have to help students you know, again, expand on their emotional literacies, think about it for themselves, think about what mindfulness, what well-being means to each of us. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but to me, your book seems to suggest that learning more about the night sky, tapping into our inner scientist, makes the act of meditative stargazing a more powerful experience. If that's right, can you expand on how we can merge knowledge and wellness. If I'm wrong, it's going to be like a, you know, end of conversation, I guess. No, you're hundred percent right. hundred percent right. So one of the things I face a lot personally, one of the things people come to me about, because a lot of my TikTok, a lot of my science communication revolves around seeing these amazing pictures from space explaining what and explaining what they mean. And a lot of people come to me and are like, these pictures make me anxious because of how big the universe is. It reminds me like how, just we cannot we our brains literally cannot grasp the scale of the universe and my response to that and part a lot of why I do what I do and what I do generally and this book in particular is understanding what you're looking at can help with those feelings understanding we all feel small at times we all feel like we're not enough we all feel like I don't know what I'm doing. What if they find out I have no idea what I'm doing? You know, the imposter syndrome, we all feel inadequate at times. And looking at it, I don't ever want people to look at a picture of space and look at the stars, to look at a nebula, to look at a galaxy and say, I feel insignificant because what it took for us to get here what it took for us to get to this point, we are all made of stardust. We're made of the stuff of the stars. And that's amazing. We're all special. We are all, we are all unique in our own ways. And like, I just never want people to, f for space and the stars to make people feel small. I want it to make them feel powerful and capable. And like, I'm here. 
against all odds, we are all here. What can we do? Like, how can we make things better? And so that's like, that's a lot of what went into this book. It was the idea that if you look at the night sky and you walk out there and you're like, I don't know what I'm looking at and I don't care, or it doesn't inspire awe or it doesn't inspire wonder, maybe understanding what you're looking at will help. Maybe, maybe getting that science. The idea is I want people to understand that they can understand it too. Science isn't for just for scientists. Science isn't just for people with PhDs. Science isn't, it's not, it doesn't have to be this gatekeeping thing. Science is for everybody and anyone can understand it if you want to. If you don't want to, totally fine. I respect that. But if you want to, and the thing that's stopping you is you feel inadequate or you feel like you're not smart enough, guess what? You are because it's actually pretty simple. Like if you want if you want to take the time and learn like that's and that's where all of this came from. And so I do really feel like understanding and like understanding the universe around us and self-acceptance are like hand in hand. I, I love that. I think it's a perfect note to end on because it's it, it sets us up, I think, for a great challenge for the academic year of how are we going to see science, not just as a point of inspiration, because it's amazing, it's awe inspiring but because it also can really connect us back with ourselves and provide us with an opportunity to take that critical pause, to invite some well-being in. And you've also talked about how this can be a social endeavor, right? I, I love that in many of your examples, you're talking about being with family and doing this together. Um, so for folks who are thinking about taking on this book maybe expanding on it as a book group and setting up a little bit of a stargazing community. Any, any thoughts? I just said that was the best note to close on, but I feel like maybe this is the best note yeah. to close on. How would you I maybe think, um, give some advice to folks who are thinking, let's do a book group. I think that is amazing. I think that would be incredible. Um, I think talking a lot about like personal relationships with the stars, why do you, or why don't you have one? Like, why do you think you, it never captured you. The one thing I will say, my main recommendation for stargazing is, and I have put this in the book as well, but take a red flashlight because you can like look through the book and read the book and that will not mess with your nighttime vision because otherwise you have to, you know, use your phone light and then wait for your eyes to readjust to the night sky. But yeah, I think I am like, I am hundred percent supportive of people who want to do like stargazing parties and stuff like that. I think it's awesome. Oh, I want to go have a stargazing party right now. Thank you for again, bringing such a great resource to us coming on the show, talking more about it. Congratulations again, the book stargazing contemplate the cosmos to find inner peace. Highly recommend. I uh, also think this is a great book to recommend to your parent and caretaker community as well. Thank you so much for, for sharing with our audience today. Thank you.